you know, his, his attitude was Shoeless Joe Jackson was guilty. And that was in the book. And so, but John Sales wanted to make him a little bit more of a, a non-conspirator. So anyway, mm-hmm. there was a little bit of a difference. And it's always a, a thing when you're playing a real, uh, you know, real life character or historical figure, you, you kind of want to get it right. But at the same time, you got to, the movie comes first, you know, so, you know, like they say, if, uh, if, the, if there's a difference between a legend and a fact, you know, and the legend's more interesting than print the legend. Baseball isn't boring because when you have a runner on first base and he hits it into the right center field gap and tries to make third base and you got a real right fielder to throw it over there, it's the most exciting play in baseball. All right, well, baseball isn't boring. And um, one person who has exhibited this for a long, long time is uh, one of the greatest actors that I know of, um, who was in one of the best baseball movies I know of, which is Eight Men Out back in the day. And that's D.B. Sweeney. Um, DB and I have, uh, have, have launched a, um, I, I think that a, a pretty noteworthy campaign, um, for a pretty noteworthy cause, which is, uh, uh the hall of fame. We're going to get to that in a second, but first of all, DB, uh, awesome to have you on, man. It's, we had a great time the other day and, and this is, this is just another, another opportunity for me to talk some baseball with you. So that's pretty cool. Yeah, this is great. Thanks for having me on. So, so let's go back. So obviously this is coming out the day that we revealed the, the hall of fame ballot and you helped me uh, execute this. And, and listen, I mean, you are today, as we sit here, you are the star of stars when it comes to the great game of baseball um, because of, because of you reprising your role, doing what that I don't think a whole lot of actors have done is reprised uh, a very, very noteworthy role. And you did that uh, in all in the cause of, revealing the hall of fame ballot so first of all db i'll just go back to it like when i contacted you to sort of perhaps partake in this now that you got to be honest man like this podcasts are honest right so what what is the uh what was your reaction what was your feeling well my first thought was i don't know i mean that sounds like uh like an odd thing to insert yourself into you know not having played pro baseball or you know like just, you know, to be the guy announcing who should go in the Hall of Fame or not, of course, your picks, but still, for me to be the guy, I was a little leery. But then when I watched your last year's uh, edition with uh, Batting Stance guy, oh, I thought, oh, this is cool. Yeah. This, is a, this is a fun thing. And I thought, okay, let's let's try and not figure out how to top it, but let's figure out a way to, like, add to it and uh, and, and do something fun that, you know, stirs the pot and, and creates more conversation. That's what it's all about, too, right? It's the conversation. And that's really why we did it. You know, and like you said, batting stance, Gar with Ryan's batting stance guy was awesome. And I remember the first time I talked to you, you said you had looked at the video and said, man, like this is this is me. And 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 that's why I think it hits me. Like you and I, you both uh, grew up Red Sox fan. You grew up in New York, just right near where Yaz grew up, right? Yeah, that's right. And, and my son, but I was in that gray area where some met, mostly Mets and Yankees fans, the odd Red Sox fan. My my brother, my kid brother was a hardcore Yankees fan. So that batting stance thing really hit home with me because we used to play <laughs> wiffle ball one on one, and he'd be the Red Sox and I'd be the Yankees, and so he'd have to start out doing Mickey Rivers batting stance. <laughs> I'd have to do Rick Burleson, and so it was all, it was really fun. It was really resonant for me. I love what that guy does, and and so yeah, it really hit home for me. Yeah, so that, that so I knew right then and there that, that this was this was going to be a, a marriage made in heaven. So it, and then we we started talking about it a little bit, and you know I when. When I did the batting stance guy a year ago and, and got a lot of traction and I'm like, okay, you know, what am I going to do next? Because I do think this is like you hit the nail on the head, DB. It's about conversation. And also it's about fun, man. It's like, let's no, okay, everybody puts their ballot out. Everybody, here's my ballot. Let's debate. That's fine. It's part of it. But still, I'm like, okay, well, am I going to have a guy in the space station read it? Am I going to have David Letterman read it? I'm like, no, I'm voting for eight guys, eight men, eight men out, eight men in. And of course, like you are the guy, you are the, and you won't, you don't have to say this, but you are the centerpiece character of that movie. Um, so when you look at, when you started said, okay, we can do this. And you started thinking about shoeless Joe Jackson, did it bring back any sort of, um, it's been a while, man. Like, right. It's been a while be, since he did the movie, but did it bring back any instant memories of, of doing that? Yeah, you know what we uh, I spent a whole summer with the Kenosha Twins in the Midwest League learning, you know, honing my left handed swing because I was a natural righty. So I really wanted to get it right. And at that time, 
Bull Durham hadn't come out yet, and nobody knew what a great job Kevin Costner was doing, you know, as a former college player, um, that he was actually really, really put, portraying a believable minor league catcher. And so n nobody had ever in Hollywood history really believably portrayed a baseball player in a movie anybody cared about him. And Gary Cooper was so unathletic and pride of the Yankees playing Lou Gehrig. They actually switched the Yankee jersey and, and had him run to third. He batted righty and ran to third base. And then they flipped the negative and it was still so bad they had to use a double from a stadium view and so and then in the great robert de niro and bang the drum slowly he's terrible i mean you don't even think he'd be a high school catcher and he's supposed wow. to be a big league catcher so so there was really a, an opportunity i thought and and so yeah it brought back a lot of those feelings of like oh wow going back to that time and you know charlie sheen was so excited to be there and cusack and david strathairn and a lot of really terrific actors and people and so i watched the movie again about a month ago coincidentally before we connected okay and movie holds up great i think i think it's oh, a fun it does. Movie. it's it's such a good movie it's such a good movie easily for me top five baseball movie and 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 to go back to sort of your baseball skills like this is one of the things that when you go back and watch a movie your baseball actions are are baseball actions like you you we talk about running first to third or or no legging out a triple right i mean i watch that again like that's a guy legging out a triple but you play baseball. But this isn't like you 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 fine tune your skills. But you had played baseball in college a little bit, right? Yeah, I played one year at Tulane, and then I played actually played one year pro ball in Perth, Australia, which was really really fun. And uh, you know, so I had a baseball background. I loved it, but acting looked looked like the right avenue for me, and I followed it. And uh, you know, one of the things about playing Shoeless Joe in 1919 was. Everything I learned, like about hitting, like I kind of uh, was a Charlie Lau student. So, <laughs> oh, the, kind of, the, Carl, the 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 the, the, the like, release the bat, you know. Oh, yeah. yeah. The bat go. And, and so that was the one thing I was really worried about doing in my lefty swing. And unfortunately, in the take that's in the movie, my hand, my left hand comes off the bat on the triple, and I'm like, ah, oh, it's perfect. Otherwise, but man, I was very much trying to. You know, to, but you know it's just different things and also just the way you you run and, and you know everything is different and john sales the director and writer of the movie had a great point for us which, which he basically said that, bef that the, the world is like before marlon brando nobody ever really thought about how you feel but he changed the way people all around the world like this self-awareness that so guys in 1919 didn't have this self-awareness you just you step up to the guy like uh, uh spencer tracy used to say you know you step up to the other guy and then tell the truth you know you don't you don't sort of think about <laughs> what the feelings are you know, don't bump into the furniture and not just for actors but for all people there was this lack of of uh you know like in your own head so that was the, the interesting thing about playing somebody from that period is like how do you you know you don't really you don't really mull things over too much well, so you, it's what, what's some of the other stuff that you did to prepare for that? Because like you said you went to the Hall of Fame, right? You, you, you know, you talk to different people. This because it's not only about playing baseball. So you act to playing baseball, playing that type of baseball, but also it's learning about what they would do, how they would say it, how they would act, all of that. What were some of the other stuff that you did leading into it? Well, I got to be good friends with Elliot Azenoff, who, uh, who wrote the book, Eight Men Out. And uh, he has a very different perspective on the world than I do. You know, he was banned during the blacklist. Um, he wrote actually that scene in Blazing Saddles where Alex Karras punches the horse. Yeah. Elliot Azenoff actually was a contract writer at Warner Brothers, I believe, if I got that wrong, forgive me, but one of the studios. And he was brought in to do a rewrite of a John Wayne movie. And in the John Wayne movie, he finds his buddy who's dead stolen horse and it's got like his stuff on it and, and but he can't really rush the camp and and but he's the horse is there and he's so frustrated and grief stricken that he punches the horse and that's where that origin that's really? so anyway yeah jack warner called elliot azenoff into his office and said azenoff did you write this and he goes yes sir i was trying to figure out how to solve the story problem and he goes you're fired john wayne doesn't punch a horse <laughs> and then anyway, so 20 years later, that found its way into Blazing Saddles, maybe independent of that, you know, That's writing. Awesome. And That's the guy awesome. ripped it off. But uh, yeah, so anyway, so Elliot Azenoff was a career Hollywood guy, but he also was a minor league pitcher, passionate baseball guy. Uh, he was in the Phillies organization, I believe. And uh, anyway, so I got to be good friends with Elliot. I went up to meet, meet him in his house in Ancramdale, in upstate New York, and we hung out a little bit. And, you know, he, his attitude was Shoeless Joe Jackson was guilty. And that was in the book. And so, but John Sales wanted to make him a little bit more of a, a non-conspirator. So anyway, mm -hmm. there was a little bit of a difference. And it's always a, a thing when you're playing a real, uh, you know, real life character or historical figure, you, you kind of want to get it right. But at the same time, you got to, the movie comes first, you know, mm -hmm. so, you know, like they say, if, uh, if, the, if there's a difference between a legend and a fact, you know, and the legend is more interesting, print the legend. So, uh, so that's, I think there's a lot of that in Shoeless Joe. 
Well, you know, I, I mentioned this to you watching the movie just the other day about I was sitting there with my wife and I said, we had this scene where David Strathorn comes into the um, into the sports writer, John Sales, who was playing the sports writer. He's like, hey, come up, pitcher. Here, come up, pitcher. I want to invite you up to my room, drink with you and basically ask you if you were cheating. I'm like, I don't think sports writers are doing that anymore. So, but it was, it was good. It was No, no, but it was. It was uh, it, there was a there was a lot of it which obviously hit home and you this was this was this was one of your I don't want to say your first movies but this was really early on in your career right very early I think it was my third or fourth movie oh, so wow. I was just kind of still figuring it out I done a lot of plays I've done twenty or twenty five plays so I mean I felt confident as an actor. But there's still there's a there's something that you don't really know until you've seen yourself in a few movies. And now I don't watch the movies anymore because I don't want to be too aware. But you know, there's really in your career that you have to educate yourself as to like what your intention was, how you wanted to come off, and how you came off. So I was still in that process of figuring out, you know, who who I am as a performer and and uh, what I can bring to that that new medium. And uh, so yeah, it was an exciting time. The, you know, the baseball, all the guys being around. You, know, you felt like you were part of something special. So I'm just glad that people are still watching it 30 years you, later. You got like Sheen involved in it, right? Or he, he you, I did. Yeah. 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 Charlie, and I, Charlie and I did this movie uh, called No Man's Land, which was really my second movie. I have, I was in this movie called Fire with Fire. I was the third guy on the right. I had whatever, 15 lines. And it was a summer in Vancouver. It was awesome. And then Francis Ford Coppola gave me the leading role in Gardens of Stone, which sort of launched me into another level where all of a sudden people just wanted to hire me sight unseen because Coppola had picked me. And so the first movie that I picked after that was called No Man's Land. And I was hired to be the main character. And then I started, you know, I was doing that kind of thing where you try to figure out what your character does. So he was a Porsche mechanic. He was a surfer. I'm, so I'm learning all these skills in L.A. And it's really fun because they're paying me to do it. They bring in the studio was Orion and they bought Platoon, which was an independent feature. And Mike Medavoy, the, who ran Orion, very smart, very prescient guy. He said, Charlie Sheen's going to be a huge star. Let's put him in this movie with D.B. Sweeney. He, they both have Vietnam movies coming out, um, but Charlie Sheen is going to be the bigger star. That's what Mike Metaboy basically said. So I didn't hear this conversation, but my agent calls me up and said, hey, D.B., Charlie Sheen's going to be in the movie. Uh, and I had had dinner with Charlie. He seemed like a great guy. So she said, well, there's a little problem. You have, you know, you have first billing. They want Charlie to have first billing. And I was like, oh, he seems like a good guy. He can have it. I don't care. <laughs> she said, wait a second. I'll just give it away. What do you want? I said, well, I, I'm out here in L.A. If you could get me a rental car, that'd be awesome. She goes, you want a rental car? And I said, yeah, whatever. She goes, don't talk to anybody. I'll call you back. So she calls me back. I was making like, is there a long time ago in the 80s? But even so, I was making $60,000 on the movie. That was my salary. She calls me back an hour later. She says, okay, you got second billing. You're making $125,000. We got you in a better hotel and a convertible rental car. And I said, wow, what will they give me if I take third billing? <laughs> she hung up on me. So, so anyway, we made the movie. It was a lot of fun. And, uh, you know, it, and Charlie actually became a huge star during the filming of the movie because Platoon came out. Yeah. So while I went off to learn to hit left-handed to do Eight Men Out, I was living in New York City primarily. Charlie went there to do Wall Street with Oliver Stone, his second Oliver Stone movie. And so one night we're at McSorley's Ale House and John Sales had said, can you recruit some of your young Hollywood actor friends to be in the movie? And so I call up Charlie, we're having a couple beers. And I said, hey, Charlie, you know, we talked about baseball on the set of No Man's Land. I said, we're, we're doing this movie. I'll be the left fielder. You'll be the center fielder. It'll be so much fun. We'll be in the World Series together. I didn't tell him that I was Shoeless Joe Jackson. He was Joe Blow, but he never read the script. He shows up in Indianapolis three months later and he's reading the script at the bar He's got a dart and and he's on a beer and he's reading it. And I walk in, he goes, Hey, hey, Dave, I'm on page 40. I don't have any lines. Where's my part? Where's my part? And to his credit, he stuck around and made the movie. So, uh, you know, he wanted to be in a baseball movie and then obviously he made other baseball movies. Yeah, that he goes to Major League, right? I mean, it's, it's, yeah. it, but it, you know, it's been, it, it, it must have been interesting for you too, is that you're looking at that movie and then obviously Field of Dreams comes out, but there's another shoeless Joe Jackson. You don't have to say this. You are the best shoeless Joe Jackson of all time. There you go. Boom. But just, just watching it, watching it, just watching another, it must have been a little bit weird, right? Well, I mean, that's such a great movie. I was, uh, you know, they came to me to see if I would be interested in playing that because they actually took our uniforms from Eight Men Out and the same uniforms are being worn by those ball players coming out of the corn that we wore in eight men out which is kind of cool that's why none of us got to keep our they let us keep our road uniforms from eight men out but the home uniforms went to that well, movie. well by, by the way now I, that's my that's my gift to you now that you have one of those yeah yeah i got now i got a uniform yeah, thanks yeah. Uh, so anyway uh uh 
they came to me and said, would you be interested in playing this? And like I said, it was my eight man. I was my third movie. So this would have been like my fourth or fifth movie. And I thought, not only am I going to be typecast as a baseball player, I'm going to be typecast as shoeless Joe Jackson. So I said, no, I don't think I want to do that. But then when I saw the movie, I was like, oh man, this is such a good movie. It's so good. And Ray Liotta was great. Rest his soul. He did a great yeah. job. And yeah. it's just a great movie. It's so emotional. And James Earl Jones had been in gardens of stone with me and I admired him so much. And, Dwyer Brown was uh, who plays Costner's dad at the end was in Cutting Edge and so there was a lot of connective tissue and but that's just a terrific movie too. It's not really a baseball movie though. I mean, it's more. Oh wow, other. that's a controversial. So we had uh, one of uh, the our uh, co-host here on the podcast, Cordy Finnick, and we were doing the best. We were ranking the best baseball movies, and she said that she said Field of Mo- Field of Dreams not a baseball movie. And we're like, what? What? I agree. With her. What? It's a father and son movie. It's a father. There's no part of the baseball that's essential to the story. They could really be playing basketball out there, just shooting, you know, playing horse and come out of the corn. I mean, I know that's taking it too far, but, <laughs> yeah. but I mean, the baseball is a wonderful backdrop for the movie, but it's really about, you know, you know, get, getting those things done that you didn't do in your youth and reuniting with your father. And, you know, there's a lot of things that are. You know, no, like no, the- it's fair. That's a good argument. I like that. I like that. But like you said, you we went on to some, some awesome, awesome movies. You're doing one right now. And so this goes to sort of when we we start talking about doing this project, um, I can say that one of the highlights uh, for me was when I think you texted and said, listen, you know, I'm paraphrasing here. I'm doing this Francis Ford Coppola movie, you know, down in Atlanta, which you are, and it's going to be an epic, epic movie. Um, you're doing a sitcom out in L.A. And I can't stop thinking about what Shoeless Joe Jackson would be saying. I'm like, oh, man, like there's a lot of pressure. So. Yeah, well, you know, I just I thought it was a great idea you had, you know, to do it. And and Shoeless Joe coming out of the winter corn, I think, is a really it's just a cool image because it, it's kind of like it's a cold day in hell that Shoeless Joe Jackson is going to talk about these ball players that, that couldn't hold his jock. And, you know, and, and it's like I just thought it some about it seemed really cool. And also, like you mentioned before, you know, not, not really any actors have ever gone back like James Caan. Well, obviously, he's killed in The Godfather. Well, let's say. Michael Corleone, like Al Pacino, if he had played Michael Corleone in Godfather 4 at age 75, like that would have been kind of fascinating to see or, or, or any, any number of examples before Dennis Hopper died, if he had gone back and played his character from Easy Rider 30 years later, where is that guy? I, I don't know. I mean, we obviously didn't do a whole movie out of it, but yeah, but I but, thought but, about who this show would be at, at age 55 or whatever he would have been when he died. Yeah, and and that was another thing is it's not only about having you reprise that, but it's also hearing what Joe Shulitz, Joe Jackson would say about these guys. I mean, we can't forget this. The guy, and 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 I guess what I'll ask is it's when I don't when I have my I have my balance. As you said, it's a conversation. It's it's we I I'm very very open to saying hey, you know what? I'm full of crap or I'm not full of crap or whatever. But with Shulitz, Joe Jackson, we can't forget this guy was so good. I mean, this guy, this guy is the ultimate. This guy is the poster boy for should be in the Hall of Fame. And these guys that I'm voting for, as you point out in, in our exercise, maybe, eh, maybe, maybe they might be not as good as Shoeless Joe Jackson. Yeah, I started thinking about when we started this conversation, you know, a few weeks ago, I started thinking about, uh, you know, there's obviously people that are, should be in the Hall of Fame who aren't. And then I started thinking about who is, who's in the Hall of Fame who's actually underrated, and, and the guy I came back to is one of my all-time favorite players, Roberto Clemente. When mm-hmm. you look at his achievements, he's obviously in the Hall of Fame. They put him in instantly when he died, which was right. But it, he died at 38, and he probably would have played, say, two, three more seasons. The Pirates were friggin' good. He might have won another championship or two. He's already got one championship. He's got an MVP, 12 gold gloves, three, uh, I want to say 320, three, somewhere between 315 and 320 career hitter. Uh, you know, one of the best ever, but people often say like, oh, Willie Mays, Mickey Mantle, Joe DiMaggio, Babe Ruth, Lou Gehrig, and those names all belong in that pantheon. But a lot of people don't come to Roberto Clemente unless you really think about it and you look right. at, you know, yeah, but but a career batting average that much over 300, 12 gold gloves, you know, in an era when he was playing in the same league with Willie Mays, you know, and, and a lot of people would have said Willie Mays was the better outfielder, but he's a center fielder. It's uh, right field is a harder position to play in many ways than center field. Center field is an athletic position, I'd argue. Right. Sure. Yeah, but- yeah, yeah. No, but better arm, you know, this unbelievable arm. And, you know, so, yeah, no, I, I agree. I, it's, it, that's the thing is that when we're ever, this is the great time. This is the great part of this time of year, honestly, where we get to have these conversations. And, and with this, I hope that people have some fun with it. So I want to get into a little bit of a, 
the behind the scenes of sort of like the day, right? The day yeah. that we did this. Um, so I, I just was like so grateful that you agreed to do it, first of all. And we were supposed to do it on the Thursday, uh, Thursday before Christmas. And I was going to fly out to Chicago. My son, who's in, in film, was going to meet us. And then they see all the blizzard. And so we're going back and forth. Like, should we power through? There's going to be a blizzard. I don't know. You know, this and that. So we, we decide, okay, you know what? I, I, well, I decide I can't take the chance. I don't know if I'm ever going to get, I don't want to be planes, trains, and automobiles and and not be able to get home for Christmas. So um, so now we I switch it to the the Monday, the day after Christmas. Now my my wife says, I've never been to Chicago. Well, okay, come along. Uh, my son's now he's home. He goes, my other son now he goes, so we're all going out to Chicago. We get the early flight and DB like, so here's the part of it, which I didn't tell you that I was really stressed about, which was the uniform. So, so I had to find a 1919 White Sox uniform and I was looking everywhere for it. I, the people, the White Sox, they were very helpful, but they couldn't track. They had that, like a giveaway one had like Frito-Lay on it. I'm not, I'm not, no, no, thanks. Um, the clubhouse guy for the White Sox, he's searching for one. Uh, I'm, I'm going, like, I'm calling places around. So everyone said, finally, they said, okay, this place grandstand in Chicago, right next to uh, Guaranteed Rate Field, they, they'll have it. I call, hey, do you have it? Yes. Oh, Thursday? Okay, I'll pick it up. Well, Thursday comes and goes. Now, the, on Christmas, all I'm thinking about, DB, is, is this place going to be open at 10 o'clock on the day after Christmas? It says it's going to be open, but it's the day after Christmas. So we fly in and we go to the 11 diner. We Well, first we go to Staples to get the, the, the cards to, for my wife to hold up the cue cards and all that stuff. So the my, 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 we go to the 11 diner and I call and it was like at 1020. And it was, I'm, I don't remember being this anxious about a call because if I don't get it, I don't know what I'm going to do. And so uh, they pick up. Oh, yes. Okay. So they're open. They get the uniform. So we go to uh, we go to Grandstand. We get in there, and um, and uh, this they had beautiful stuff, man. Like they had, I think they had two different versions of the jersey. We got that's the jersey that you saw. They get the hats. They got everything. So now I'm feeling good about things. And now we're gonna go. We're gonna go meet you at that uh, at the place where like I'm trying to like look this up. And it's Portellos, right? Portellos. Portillo's. Portillo's, yes. And so I'm like, there's a million Portillos. Like, what is this? Like, what is this? So anyway, we go there and we we sub shop and here you come and I get to meet you for the first time. And right away, we're just talking and you and my family were just talking. My wife's asking you about the cutting edge and why she's, you know, writing down stuff. And um, and you gave me the best hot dog. You, you like you got it like that. It was just such a great experience, the whole thing. And so we uh, so I so we well, I spent a half an hour, 45 minutes there eating, talking. And OK, here we go. And you had a buddy, so this is this is this is where I was so appreciative of like you like I found a cornfield right, and the original cornfield was different because they're finding a cornfield around Chicago in the winter not that easy, right? But you said I found one, and then you found one closer uh, through your buddy. You're gonna have to remind me of his name, so I want to give him a lot of props. Carey. Yeah, what's yeah. his name? Mike Carey, MJ Carey, MJ Carey. So it's not be masker together. Exactly. So it's actor. Uh, so just. And so he's like, I got to go. So we drive out, we pile in your pickup, we drive out, we have another great conversation. He talked to you all day, as this is evidence right here. And so uh, we drive out and see your buddy and like, it's like a housing development. Like, where's the cornfield? You're going to have to trust me. There's a cornfield. And so you drive over and like, the, he tells you where to go. We drove out and there it is. There's the cornfield, right? But we don't know where to sort of set up shop. And I think that, you, you know, there was, well, are people going to see us? Are they going to kick us out? Whatever it is. But I'll still say this, DB. Oh, and I forgot to mention, too, a, a, an integral part of the whole thing, which was, I was like, how is he ever going to be able to do this, like, chewing Red Man? Like, what is, what is, he's going to, like, I know Red Man is a powerful thing, especially if you haven't done it. So we had to stop at Whole Foods and get raisins, right? Well, you had said they used apricots in the movie. Yeah, and the, I, well, I used a lot of tobacco, actually. When I used to play baseball a long time ago in the 70s and early 80s, um, we actually still chewed. Like, you know, there was no prohibition against it in high school baseball or college baseball. No. We all did it. And But sometimes, you know, you could I couldn't do it the whole game. So we take like a bazooka bubble gum and you make kind of like a shield 
around the, the tobacco wad and then some of it leaks out. So it's not as intense as like just tobacco. But there were times in Eight Men Out where I would actually be chewing and, you know, they, that was fine back then in the movies too. You could never do that. But there were days when it was like, man, I don't really feel like it. I'm hungover or whatever, or I just don't, I had a bad breakfast. So we used dried apricots. And in the last scene of the movie, I have dried apricots. And it was actually the only argument John Sales and I had, which was like, I was like, look, he's in hell. He's playing minor league baseball in New Jersey. Um, you know, he, all he has left is his enjoyment of tobacco. He said, you have so much apricots in there that it's pulling your eye down. We have to have left. <laughs> oh, really? So that was the only time he and I had a disagreement because uh, oh. I thought he was trying to make me make it go away. But, but yeah, the raisins were great. Well, well, I tell you what. So my son Colby, he goes into Whole Foods, gets the raisins, like boom, boom, boom. That works out. We go out. Um, so we find this sort of like path road. It looked like sort of next to a construction site, which seemed perfect. And I still say that it was key that we had a pickup truck because it looked like we blended in with any other construct. No one was going to kick us out. So we're, then we set up shop and, um, and, you know, and I just, I just like was, I am so appreciative, like how, how you, I mean, you just were into it, man. I don't know how else to say it. I was appreciative of my whole family that being there. And it was, it was honestly for me, and it's maybe some people say, oh, well, you know, it's, it's about, it, it meant a lot to me. It meant a lot because in a lot of different ways, not only because I feel like we did something special, but also for us, for my family, like, you know, you, you saw my wife hold up the cards and my son's getting the raisins and my other son's filming it and everything else. It was a meaningful thing, and the, and then as invested as you were, like that was it was such a cool thing, man. So yeah, great. I got inspired that your whole family. I didn't know your whole family was coming, and and I thought it was going to be you holding an iPhone, and that would have been fine too. But when your son Riley stepped up and he had he had a great camera and he knew what he was doing, and he you know he you know he was like also like you know that's that's the fun when you're an actor and and the, and the, the camera operator the sound guy which we didn't have a sound guy it was riley yeah. and he did a great job with that as well but it's like when when you feel like everybody's rowing in the same direction and and you know you just feel like wow we got a chance to do something cool like to me that's the energy of that's what rejuvenates me as an actor and i feel like we have that right now on megalopolis the coppola movie where yeah. you know he's making this 120 million dollar movie with his own money and John Voight's there and Adam Driver and Dustin Hoffman and Aubrey Plaza and all these great people and nobody's getting like their top market price what they could get on another movie but everybody feels like wow this could be special and so I just think that's the attitude I try to bring to to all the stuff that I that I do and you know and, and you never know where you're going to get uh somebody's going to bring inspiration or or uh, energy that's going to put it over the top and and i thought your son riley was a tremendous asset well my uh, my takeaway from that you just compared francis for paul coppola to my son riley so there you go oh, riley, uh, yeah. <laughs> to put another resume but oh. you know it's it's but when you guys were talking like you said i one of the things i also came away was because that's my initial thing was i'll go out there i'll film it i'll do my best and whatever I'm like, oh, this is so much better doing it this way. And you and Riley were sort of speaking a, a different language about framing. And and one of the things, too, about the cornfield, and I noticed this right away. It, I mean, it was just my opinion, but I think it was right, where we were worried about, okay, the corn's dead, right? Obviously, it's the winter, the corn's dead. But the height of the corn, for me, was so perfect. And 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 the sky, the way the sky was, it was so per everything about it was other than being like negative 10, you know, everything, the setting of it was so perfect. And and I can't say how much how I'll say it again, how appreciative I was. You're standing out there in the freezing cold, but I have this image of you, and it looks like you have a big wad of tobacco in and you're shoeless Joe Jackson and you're talking like shoeless Joe Jackson. And and <laughs> like all of it was was right there in 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 it was just like such a good scene for me i don't know man so yeah, i think it's a great it's a great moment in time and i i just hope it uh it, baseball fans enjoy it and and you know obviously i i didn't i wasn't trying to disparage any of the players on your ballot they're all no no we have a, players so, we, and, so so we have so on the on the video as people see i said these are the pe these are the players rob bradford believes in the uh, believes what should be in the hall of fame Shoeless Joe Jackson question mark. Well, dot dot dot. <laughs> you know, so but that but that's but that's part of it. And if anyone wants to like say otherwise, then they're 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 wrong. So it, it that's part of it. You said it at the beginning. It's part of the conversation. How can you not watch this and think about, oh, oh, that's right. This guy like had a different perspective, much like a lot of people who leave the ballot. So I guess what I would say to this, uh, what do you think? 
you said at the end of the video like Billy Wagner is that it like you think he would be checking off Billy Wagner and that's it yeah I mean uh for Shoeless Joe yeah I think Shoeless Joe would go with Billy Wagner because you know I, I mean I think first of all he's probably you know he's less um likely to warm to Dominican players let's just say for example yeah yeah, you know, yeah. You know, sign the time. Time from born in 1890 you know he's not that he's an out and out racist or whatever but he's from Greenville South Carolina he's probably going to be more in favor of people that look like him yeah and that are from places like him so that's why I immediately went to Billy Wagner but also Billy Wagner uh, man I should have reviewed this but I think Billy Wagner is like fifth or sixth all time in saves well yeah um, I mean I feel good about that pick I, I honestly yeah. so I mean I think if everybody everybody who's got more saves than him is in the hall of fame I yeah. think yeah and I, I remember him being an incredibly dominant player you know a game-changing player obviously Manny Ramirez and Alex Rodriguez they are among the top 10 hitters of all time both of them but the steroids thing is that's when it gets into the conversation who gets in who doesn't so but as far as all the other players there I don't think any of them are Hall of Famers myself yeah so so that's what that's what I want to ask you that's what I'm going to give you the floor okay I'm going to give you the floor here you go you've earned the you know forget about having 10 <laughs> years straight in the Baseball Writers Association you've earned the right to vote by by contributing to this uh this video to this uh cause so DB Sweeney you saw the ballot. Who are you voting for? Now you can't go more than ten. I don't think you're gonna. You're a guy who's gonna go more than ten. But who are you voting? No, for? I, I think, I think you've got the eight best guys on the ballot as your picks for sure. Now the question is, do they all go? And to me, it's Billy Wagner, and then it's A Rod and Manny Ramirez with a very strong bright red asterisk. And okay. I think that my this whole thing is Clemens goes in. Uh, you know, they all Barry Bonds goes in, but they go in a special area called the Rogues Gallery. Okay. It's sort of like, you know, you make it's like the asterisk gallery where it's like you can't deny what these guys did in baseball, but we're also not going to endorse what they did, whatever the other kind of characteristics. And then maybe we move Ty Cobb over there. Maybe we move a couple other guys. Ed Delahanty, I think, is another guy with uh, you know, they say he might have killed a guy, you know, threw a guy off a tree. If I'm getting that wrong, but you know, no. there, are, there are people in the Hall of Fame that were not, you know, model citizens. So let's let's just, and I bet you that rogues gallery, quote unquote, whatever, somebody will think of a better name than that. But it's sort of like the the the, the hall of infamy, maybe in, within yeah. Cooper's the hall of whatever that somebody will think of something good. And uh, but anyway, I better be the most visited part of the Hall of Fame. Oh, yeah, I know. There's no question. And I've heard other people say suggest something like that. This is so when I vote for mine, you know, to sort of explain myself. Like I said, I'm open for debate. It's just I just kind of throw my hands up, man. Like because there's there's probably guys who everyone's saying, "Oh no, they didn't do it." Well, you don't know. You just don't know. You you don't know. And 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 it, like yeah. problem is, and I don't have any problem say, someone saying, "Well, I'm not voting for Manny. I'm not voting for A Rod," because they were definitively popped for this. So I understand that. But um, yeah, it's it's a. Uh, this is what it's about. It's about conversation. And, and also it's about having fun, which is, you know, I hope you had fun. And no, and no disrespect to you. I had a great time, but the other five guys on your ballot, Roland Beltran, Andrew Jones, Sheffield, um, Sheffield and uh, Helton. Helton. I mean, great players, unbelievable players, but I never felt none of those five guys as a fan watching them through their careers. I never felt like, Oh, 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 here comes Helton. We're in trouble. The way, you know, like Manny Ramirez, you know, if you're a Red Sox fan and there's two guys on base and one out and Manny's coming up and you need a run, you probably got to run, you know, yeah. and but Helton was a great statistical player, great player, great citizen. The same thing with Beltran, same thing with all of these guys, great players, but Hall of Famers, I don't know, I feel like they're just one rung below that. I probably don't disagree with you. I mean, I, I, last year, you know, we, we had one guy go in with Ortiz and, and be perfectly, I don't think anyone's going to get in this year. But uh, but it's it's it, the 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 biggest takeaway from this year's Hall of Fame voting is at the top of the list, Shoeless Joe Jackson reemerges once again. I love it. I love it. DB, I can't thank you enough, man. I really appreciate it. And I look forward to uh, I look forward to you coming to Fenway Park and doing a, a good three innings in the broadcast booth. Oh, man, I would love it. I love it. I mean, Fenway Park is just such a shrine. You know, I've been in Chicago the last several years and. Wrigley Field is, is a wonderful place, and it's the second best ballpark in America. So uh, I'd love to get back to the uh, to the original shrine and, uh, and and spend some time with you there. And tell me, tell everybody once again all the things that you have coming up because because you, you're a busy guy and it's uh, 
it's it's a it's some good good stuff it's some stuff that like i could do another five podcasts talking to you about the other stuff that you're doing but why don't you go ahead yeah well you know i feel very blessed that you know after 30 years they're still you know letting me do what i love to do and uh I'm in Megalopolis, uh, Francis Ford Coppola film, which will not be out until at the earliest, I think, Christmas 24. Uh, I'm on a couple episodes of Call Me Cat, which is a Fox sitcom with Mayan Bialik, which is, uh, I think my first one's January 9th, but it's Thursday nights at nine o'clock on Fox. And uh, I've been reunited on that with the, the showrunner is Jim Patterson, who I did Be Positive with last year, and we did Two and a Half Men for a season. So he's one of my favorite, you know, uh, showrunner boss type guys that I've gotten to work with in Hollywood. And uh you know, just banging away. I got a couple things that I actually wrote, which hopefully I'll have some good news about that soon. But, you know, just, you know, scratching and clawing, just trying to stay relevant. Oh, trying dude, to stay like, I love, I love, no, I love the whole thing. And I've loved getting to know you. And I love also like this, the car ride back and forth and, and the, eating the hot dogs. And the, it was just such a great day. The last thing is, as we ask everybody, I'm going to ask you to just say, give me an example. Give me one thing. We say, why isn't baseball boring? Um, and uh, it can be Jonathan Papelbon said it's grown men wearing grown men wearing tight pants. I just had Eduardo Perez give me a four minute soliloquy about this, but and it can be anything at all. In, in DB Sweeney's eyes, why isn't baseball boring? Baseball isn't boring because when you have a runner on first base and he hits it into the right center field gap and tries to make third base and you got a real right fielder to throw it over there, it's the most exciting play in baseball. Oh man, you scratch right where I itch. I said that that I've always said that is what one of the best plays in all of sports. Oh, excellent. Well done. All right, DB. Thanks so much. Thank you, bud. Talk to you soon.